So if you're familiar with this channel, you might also be familiar with a series where we look at how you can build a watch collection at different budgets and price ranges. How we do this typically, and today we're looking at $7,000, is we go through, pick out different personas that might influence the way or how you will buy watches or what you look for in watches, and think about with those personas how you could spend X amount of dollars. Today we're looking at $7,000. We have seven different personas. So all of these are different tracks that you could take to build a $7,000 collection, depending on your collecting philosophy. Keep in mind that all the pricing in this video is gonna be based on retail pricing because I don't wanna use pre-owned because people will probably be mad when something changes in the future and saying, why was that uh, X amount of dollars when now it's this? Just wanna avoid that. We'll be looking at retail prices only, but let's take a look at these personas to start. For Persona 1, we have check off the boxes. This is the type of collector that needs to have a watch for every scenario, even if those scenarios never happens. Persona 2 is the one watch collection. This is the type of person that tries their best to find one watch that can meet all their needs and finds joy in the simplicity of reaching for the same watch every day and maximizing their budget. Persona 3 is the hipster. This collector can't stand anything mainstream, so they spend the majority of their time picking out boutique watches and micro brands. Persona 4, the diver fanatic. This collector is fascinated and only with the world of dive watches. Persona 5 is the perfect duo. This collector likes simplicity, but can never settle with just one watch, so they opt for the balance of a dress and sports everyday piece. Persona 6 is a formal collector. This individual either needs to dress up in formal attire all the time or just value simplicity. They will require at least two dress watches to match their many outfits. And then for Persona 7, we have the three watch collection. This collector likes having three perfect watches to cover all their bases. One dress, one every day, and one sports watch. Now, before we jump into this first persona, definitely check out teddybaldestar.com, the new pre-owned section, getting in new pre-owned models every single week. These are all hand curated, really trying to pick out some amazing models that I think are a great fit for the things that we talk about here, as well as just some great examples in the industry that are also at solid prices in the process. Also, if you're looking to sell your watch and move on from something, definitely consider us when trying to sell your watch. Uh, fill out the form on the product page on the website, and one of my colleagues will be in touch if it's a good fit for our program. Check it out. Now for our first persona here, we have the check off the boxes individual. So we'll look at all of the different style of watches. They're trying to really just cover everything with their collecting philosophy. And I know this really includes a lot of people out there. So I just wanna show how you can maybe do this and stretch this to $7,000. First here, we're looking at the Nomos Club Campus 38. So to me, this is the everyday approach, taking much of what is work from their dress pieces and combining it to an everyday style watch that has a lot of the same design elements, minimalist approach in terms of what it's going for, but also getting some nice peace of mind when it comes to the utility from a sports perspective. 100 meters of water resistance, still getting the manual Nomos Alpha manual caliber on the inside. With the price range that we have this one at, we have a closed case back, so you're not unfortunately going to be able to see the open case back because this is a very well-crafted move and it looks great as well. Uh, but 38.5 millimeter case going to wear closer to that of a 39 to 40 millimeter watch, but still thickness on this, 8.5 millimeters, gonna slide underneath a wide variety of dress cuffs. The longer silhouette of the lugs with this model is going to make this one wear larger, so just keep that in mind. There are smaller variants available, but to me, this is a great everyday option that maybe isn't going so much for the utility side of German watchmaking, but instead going for more of the design approach while still getting some sports utility in the process. Now rounding out our dress category, I wanna go for something that is often overlooked. I wanna look at Seiko with the SPB 115. Now, I really like this watch for a variety of reasons. Sure, it might not be the most entry level option from Seiko from the dress watch category, but it's doing some different things that I find is unique for the price segment in which it resides. You're looking at just north of $1,000 here for the watch itself, just a shade under 40 millimeters with the case size thickness is gonna be in a middle ground there, not as thick as some of their other offerings and a lug to lug of 47.2. But the two things that make this watch unique, 100 meters of water resistance for a dress watch, which I think is great. But then also this is going to come with an enamel dial. And for $1,000, that is spectacular to see. And this one I prefer compared to some of the other variations from Seiko that are using enamel dials. There's also a corresponding white dial version, but this one to me just pops way more with that kind of chocolate brown and white contrast from the hands, the spade hands on the front. And this is a beautiful looking watch. It's understated, well done, and one of the 
best ways to get into enamel at a more attainable price range and also has some other things going for it. Wearable case, reliable 6R35 movement on the inside with that extended power reserve, 100 meters of water resistance, and one of the more attainable options to get an enamel dial out there on the market in general. And I think this is a unique dial color and type that you're going to find. Now for our dive watch category, we have Certina with the DSPH200M. So Certina from a watchmaking perspective makes some of the best dive watches for $1,000. I say them and Mito probably the two best kind of battling it out for that, I would say more professional dive watch right around this segment. There's certainly some other ones out there from Doxa, Squale, other brands. We've looked at uh, dive watches under $1,000 as a video, but Certina is just so overlooked, and I think this would complement some of the other models that you're gonna have in this collection. A 42.8 millimeter case, it is going to wear rather true to that with that lug-to-lug -lug dimension of this watch. 200 meters of water resistance, but the approach, the look, the construction of the case as well as the bracelet, it's just so well done. Also getting a power reserve that's going to be extended, giving you some peace of mind there, sapphire crystal. And the gilt markings really do help in kind of evoking a lot of that vintage charm that I kind of want to go for here uh, from the dive watch category while still leaning on the modern uh, utility that will come from this style of dive watch. So if you've ever seen the check off the boxes persona in the past in other videos, you know that the complication part of this equation is always the one that takes the most of the budget. And that's the same here. But for this, we actually are starting to get into a range where you can look at some pretty complicated watches. But here I wanna look at maybe the most complicated watch you can find for the money for around $3,000 or so. And that is with the Master Calendar Chronograph from Longines. Now let's take a step back. If you're talking about a calendar chronograph from pretty much every single brand, you're talking five figures at the bare minimum. And if you're looking at a brand like Patek Philippe, even when they were using Lamania based calibers, you're looking at well over $150,000 to get into one of their watches. So we're talking about the 5970 for an example. Here we're getting an annual calendar plus a chronograph for just north of $3,000. On top of that, a well-finished case and dial all to go along with this. It's just remarkable what you're getting in this package. Although this is not gonna be the Longines that I would say it's going to be the most popular, but for the true watch enthusiast that just wants to get into complications and wants something that is going to maybe round off and just be unique for what you're gonna find for the budget that you have here, this absolutely stands out. By taking this modified value-based architecture, you get something rather special in the price category. Very wearable as well with a 46.3 millimeter lug to lug and a 40 millimeter case. And the thickness, all things considered, you're getting a chronograph and an annual calendar on this watch and somehow it's still thinner than some of the leading luxury chronographs on the market from the likes of like a Breitling, uh, even some Tudor watches and even Tag Heuer. So this is really a cool watch and where it's being positioned. Probably not a more complicated watch that you can find out there on the market, just given Longines ability to have access to these kind of exclusive Eta calibers uh, at their disposal. Now we do not have much money left over here, but we're looking at the beater category for this type of collector. So with this considered, we're gonna look at Casio with the Casio. Now this watch has just become beloved by so many. You have so many different dial colors or case colors, I should say, or those different resin cases. The handset analog digital display is just a unique execution. This is less of a G-Shock. It's not really a G-Shock, it's its own thing. And that's why I think it's a combination of say something like the Casio Duro with like a DW5600, kind of those two watches had like a baby. This is what I would think would come out. Like the DW5600, it is going to be wearable. Uh, gonna work pretty true to like a 41 and a half to 42 millimeter case when you have this one strapped onto the wrist. Completely wearable on my wrist because it just really comes down to what is the intended purpose of the watch. That gives you, to me, more flexibility on whether or not you can pull something off or not. I personally like the gray version the most. It has this ghosted and neutral execution that I think it makes it very versatile, and that's what I'd be looking for for this beater watch. Never to be out of place, and always can do the job. For our next persona, we have the One Watch Collection. This is where you're gonna maximize your budget for $7,000. What can you get as the best watch out there? I have a few different ones to go through here, and I think there's several different options as I typically do. I will just kind of you know, glance at them, talk about them briefly, 
and kind of just say that, hey, you have a lot of different things to go for. I think the first brand to look at here, because they have a couple models that I would maybe suggest, uh, looking at the Seamaster 300, if you want something sporty, you could also go for the Speedmaster being underneath your price segment here, both going to appeal to classic professional watches from Omega in their different model families. Both of them can certainly be uh, workable if you're looking for that one watch. I would say the Seamaster, in many ways is going to be more versatile than the Speedmaster because the Speedmaster doesn't give you any inherent upside when it comes to the dressy category and doesn't offer the same utility that a dive watch would. So I'd probably lean on the Seamaster 300. If you want something that's really on the fence of being dress and also having some utility for the day-to-day, -day, I would look at the Globemaster. This watch to me is one of my favorite watches being produced by Omega, but unfortunately does not get the love that it deserves. I think just a lot of people just get caught up in maybe not liking the uh, pipe hand style dial, the tungsten fluted bezel on the outside. I really don't know what it is, but this is, I think, an overlooked gem from Omega and right around $7,000 retail for the, it on the bracelet and slightly less when you're talking about it on the strap. Another brand, of course, you have to consider here is Rolex. I will say they're just being a caveat here of if you can actually get it. I, of course, would say get it at retail if you can, but that's a big if. So I would go for the 124270, the classic Rolex Explorer. This, to me, offers just everything you would want from an everyday luxury watch. If you can get it for close to retail, then absolutely no brainer for this price range and certainly going to be a classic design from Rolex. Still one of my favorite contemporary watches that the brand makes. Another overlooked example is going to be the Zenith DeFi. Just love the look of this watch. Kind of goes off that integrated sports uh, style that's going to be very popular at the high horology perspective, getting it into a package around $7,000. Certainly a cool looking watch and the dial is just spectacular to look at. Those cantilever faceted indices on the dial just look as if they're extending out over the central surface and just add so much depth to that dial. I truly adore this watch. You could also look at the SBGA 471 or any of the models with the 62 GS cases. I just like how these wear on the wrist and Grand Seiko in general offers a lot in that six to $7,000 range. So plenty to get lost in. Now, next up, we have the hipster category for our Persona 3. And first, we have the Baltic MR01. So this is going to be one of the more interesting dress watches that you're going to find for under $1,000, mostly because of the movement inside. It's going to feature a micro rotor movement. It's going to be sourced and made in Asia. So if you care a lot about origin, then this might be an issue for you. But otherwise, there's a lot of just appeal with flipping this watch around and just seeing the actual finishing on display. It's a well, it's just a really good looking movement. There's no question about it. And it also kind of just goes to show this differentiation as you're kind of building this collection. Not really th anything else like it. Uh, wearability and case as well as the dial, all very well done. 36 millimeters might be on the small end for many people. It's gonna wear rather true to that with that lug to lug at 44 millimeters. That blasted kind of grained dial surface is also spectacular to look at up close, both the front and the back of this watch, a lot of nice things to look at. Next, we have Christopher Ward with the C1 Moon Glow. This is just a cool looking moon phase, very similar to Meister Singer and their Lunascopes, and these brands actually have a connection in terms of the movements that they're utilizing, so hence why some of these actually look similar. But this photorealistic moon phase that you're gonna find at the 12 o'clock, just looks spectacular up close. It is going to retail for the higher range for Christopher Ward standards, but uh, I would say one of the more established types of micros or kind of hybrid independence because Christopher Ward has expanded quite a bit in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Wearability is going to be rather true to its proposed case size diameter, looking at 40.5 millimeters. Really the star of the show here, or maybe not the star, but the moon of the show is going to be that photorealistic moon. It, there's not really many brands that are utilizing this style. A lot of moon faces take a back seat. It's kind of understated. This is more in your face, which I think really is pulled off well here. For the dive watch category in our hipster range, we have the Manta Ocean King. Now, this design is not the most inventive style or thing you've ever seen before, but in terms of finishing, like many other Manta watches out there, incredibly well done. Lug to lug is going to be proportional to that case size at 49 millimeters. Also thin on the wrist at 11.9 millimeters. They got this under 12 millimeters thick for a 300 meter plus dive watch. Sapphire crystal, well finished case. The hands on this, those sword style hands, they have that polished faceted look to them. Just look spectacular. But just a well finished micro, Monte really class leading when it comes to the price range that they represent. I'd say them and Formex are probably the two best finished watches that I think you can come across for under $2,000 regardless of brand. 
And to round ourselves off here, we have the Ferrer Bernina. One thing I have to say about micro brands is they typically shy away from using chronographs, perhaps for good reason, getting access to certain movements as well as pulling off a chronograph. People overlook how complicated they really are. This is done very well. Infuses the eccentric color profile that many Ferrer watches demonstrate in doing this in a chronograph design. This is unique. It looks different compared to the competition. It has a really interesting array of color that's being used and they do a nice job of kind of using opposites of the color wheel to not have these crazy uses of colors clash with one another and also keeping in mind legibility. I think this is a great way to execute on that. 100 meters of water resistance, wearable case, SW510 from Salita on the inside and a sapphire crystal. So now for Persona 4, we have the Diver Fanatic. There's two ways to go about this. You could either make a long list of different dive watches, which once you're getting to $7,000, I just feel like that's not how I would think most people would go. Maybe they would, I don't know, but that's one way you could go. I decided to just do more of a hybrid, looking at a luxury dive watch that can fill that void and then going for more of a tool watch that with that type of appeal that's just straight down to business with its looks. So here I have the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter at that entry position. Ceramic bezel, wave dial, uh, of course, some people might not like the helium escape valve, but is going to appeal more towards the luxury segment of dive watches with its flashier nature in regards to the ceramic and wave dial. It's of course down to business in terms of what it's going to be able to withstand and do, but on the flip side also has that kind of flash that you would wanna have and associate with a luxury watch you're gonna spend $5,000 on. Omega coaxial 8800 on the inside, 49.5 millimeter lug to lug dimension, 300 meters of water resistance, going to wear, I would say, rather true to the 42 millimeters, if not smaller, closer to that of a 41 millimeter case. Thickness is going to be kind of middle of the road here at 13.5 millimeters. With the Omega Seamaster family and looking at the last 25 or now almost going on 30 years, this is really kind of what have, we've just seen as the popular model from Omega. I would imagine with the Speedmaster has to be their best selling model. It kind of sits at that entry door gateway into the luxury world of dive watches in many ways. Now maybe with Tudor coming into the fold, uh, maybe undercutting what this watch is representing, but still this sits in a unique light in the industry. And I think for that first dive watch, your first luxury dive watch, has to be on a short list of ones to consider. Now with that being our more luxury segment type of dive watch, what could be on the flip side, something that could complement it. And I wanted to go all the way into this tool watch look with the Marathon GSAR anthracite case. So this comes in a black PVD case, which might be too much for some people. You have that recessed dial with the tritium, the handset, what it's going for with the black case. It has this tactical look, no question about it, but I think this could complement and also be right down the alley of somebody that might be interested in just all things dive watches. It just has that certain type of appeal that I think would resonate. This is also available on a full anthracite bracelet to match the case, which is pretty cool. Wearability, I find these wear pretty close to a 40 millimeter case with that 48 millimeter lug to lug and a 41 millimeter case size, 300 meters of water resistance, automatic Salita SW200 on the inside, sapphire crystal, but tritium, it's used and execution that really recessed dial as well that Marathon uses to give enough clearance for those hands to pass over the tritium tubes of the dial is unique to them. There's really nothing else like this dial execution. One other thing to keep in mind with the black PVD coating, it typically holds up well, but you run the risk of with any black PVD or any PVD coating that it could show signs of wear. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're looking in the direction of these style of pieces. Uh, mostly where you're gonna have a concern for this would be on the bracelet, uh, maybe on the underside of the buckle, but otherwise, Really cool, tactical, if you like this style, one of the best in that $1,000 to $2,000 price range. Now, Persona 5, we're looking at the perfect duo. One sports watch, one dress watch. Now for the sports watch, I wanna look at the Tudor Black Bay 58 925 Sterling Silver. So this model, when first unveiled, I remember when they said, oh, silver. And I'm like, okay, yeah, silver dial. Like, you know, it's not really silver. I don't know what they're talking about. But then I did a double take, I'm like, oh, wait. The entire case is made of silver. That I have not seen very often. And of course there's questions of how this will age over time. I think now that these have been in the market for some time, there's a little bit more answers out there on the internet about how these will patina as they age. 
Tudor in terms of their history of using bronze, usually uh, they utilize an alloy that is better and less serious at aging than some other brands out there on the market. So I think you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but to me, this is a cool representation of this sports category, having some flair in the process. You have a mix of more traditional style of watchmaking with an eccentric uh, case material that matches and brings together a cool dichotomy that really comes together in a nice end result. Open case back on these as well. So that is also an interesting thing. You don't get a bracelet option for these models with these silver cases, but still Black Bay 58 DNA with something that's different, unique. Not a watch that anybody saw coming, but the muted color profile that this one has, I think it makes it so versatile in terms of how you can match it with different outfits. So you're talking about maximizing that sports category. I think from a look department, this certainly does it. Now I have about 3000 or so dollars to spend when it comes to a dress watch. I think there's a few brands that lead this category, but I would say one of the leaders has to be Nomos, and here we have the Nomos Orion. You have a few different case style options that you can go for, but what I would recommend here is certainly going for the open sapphire case back so you can actually see that uh, Nomos alpha manual caliber movement on the inside. Of course, this is gonna be pulling from the Pazoo 7001 in terms of styling, but it does get some up finishing techniques, also getting some hacking. Uh, they are producing these in their own facility because of the lack of access to those movements as Nomos was scaling over the last 30 years of their existence. 38 millimeter watch version is going to wear larger than that 38 millimeters, closer to that of a 39 millimeter dress watch. So just keep that in mind. I own the 35 millimeter version uh, just because I felt that it was a little bit more appropriate for my wrist size, uh, but thin on the wrist, well-crafted, you have different styles and colors to go for, all understated in the process. But I like the combination of the gold applied indices with the blue steeled hands that are gonna be heat treated. It just comes together very well uh, and just simply works in my opinion. Now for Persona 6, we have the formal collector. So this is somebody that is really prioritizing dress watches. And how I always like to think about this is I'm thinking of styles of cases and different styles of dress watches that can still give you some diversity and coverage from the versatility department, even within this formal category. And to start us off here, I wanna look at the new King Seikos that were recently unveiled at the time of uh, recording this video. Here we have the SPB 279. Now I think these are going to be a hit. You just look at where Seiko is able to kind of hit these in terms of the price is in a range where I think makes a lot more sense. This is where I think the King Seiko range could uh, actually do quite well. When they start getting these priced around $3,000, I think you have a branding problem and an issue, but here this just seems to be more appropriate in terms of pricing and also has some other things going for it that I think are just allowing these to really separate from maybe some of the other competition. A couple things to mention, just the finishing of the cases, but 37 millimeters with the case size, 43.6 millimeters with that lug to lug. This is gonna wear like a true 37 classic 1960s King Seiko, which is pretty cool to see. 12.1 millimeters on the thickness, so even thinner than those cocktail times. Water resistance though, amazing. 100 meters on these King Seikos. I think this is fantastic. I'm really excited to see how these do and how uh, the market is going to react as well. Automatic Seiko 6R31 on the inside, nice extended power reserve with those. But the looks of these, the finishing of these, the case sizing of these, and even the pricing, I think, make these unique. This is the one that I would say is the sportier of our trio here from the formal category. Uh, but a great representation of what you can get from a Japanese dress watch under $2,000. It also will have some maximized versatility if you did want to maybe maybe lean a little bit more into that sporty uh, type of a styling. Now, I always like to put a rectangular or square watch in this category. And here I want to put a more recent unveiled watch with the Oris Rectangular. So these watches are going to kind of combine a couple elements. They have these fun, playful dials. They have these rectangular cases that are going to maybe pull a little bit from uh, the Cartier tank, but it has its own Oris flair. I almost see uh, some design traits from their uh, big crown pointer date families uh, and some like kind of sector, sector dial elements and what it's going for here. It, it works and I think is different in a welcome new family and also kind of those Mustang Cartiers, a more attainable way of getting into that model family without kind of the brand uh, connection to Cartier, I think is quite well done. These are going to be smaller watches with case sizes of 25.5 millimeters across. And then looking at a lug to lug of 38 millimeters. This is when talking about a circular watch equivalent closer to that of a 35, 36 millimeter case. Uh, it is going to optically look different on the wrist. So 
that all has to factor into the equation here. But I like how these can kind of fill that void of like the Mustang Cartiers. They're falling under $2,000. And I think these could do quite well, even though dress watches in general are typically not something that are as booming in terms of popularity. A alternative to the Mustang Cartiers at a price range under $2,000. Now we have about $3,000 or so dollars left and I'm trying to get differentiation and complication, style, dial, what is it going for? And I wanted to get a moon phase, so how can I get a moon phase in the remaining budget? What's the most unique thing or looks different? I wanna look at Frederic Constant with the classic moon phase manufacturer. So this is a movement here on the inside that is produced within Frederic Constant's facilities. They market this as in-house. It is going to have a different style of architecture and finish compared to most of the movements that you're gonna find in this price range. 48.6 millimeters with the lug-to-lug -lug with a 42 millimeter case size diameter. It is gonna work closer to that of a 40 and a half millimeter case, rather slim on the wrist as well at 11 and a half millimeters, all things considered. 50 meters of water resistance in a price range just south of $3,000 uh, for this one at retail. And kind of how I'm thinking about this, you have your square rectangular watch with the Oris, and then you have the King Seiko that's going to have more traditional circular watch, but also going to have some sportier elements to it with that feasibility in the water resistance department. And then you have this that's very classic in terms of its approach, utilizing a moon phase, also getting some manufactured elements uh, from FC here. Uh, it's kind of rounded out for our trio. And now for our final category, we have Persona 7 with the three watch collections. So we're looking at a dive watch, everyday watch, and a dress watch. How can we just maximize our coverage with three different styles of watches? First, we have the dive watch category with the Tudor Pelagos Fixed. So this is a watch that some people love, some people don't love. I enjoy it. I don't think it's the Tudor Pelagos that many people were looking for. At the time of recording this video, it's kind of still pending on what's going to be unveiled at Watches and Wonders. So maybe something new and improved will be unveiled by the time of this being released. So this could be old news. But to me, this really epitomizes that tool watch DNA that the Pelagos is going to embody. Right under $4,000, you're getting an MT5602 movement on the inside with a 70 hour power reserve, 200 meters of water resistance, so less water resistance than typical. The lug to lug, a little deceiving, 51.4 millimeters, but given the fixed lugs here, it does not appear that when you actually have a strap on the wrist, like you're not gonna see the full extension of what these lugs are going to project out. So just keep that in mind. It is thinner than the typical Pelagos, Great to see, 12.6 millimeters. Uh, they did make some sacrifices to the space from the dial to the crystal and also getting rid of the traditional rehot as well, which some people really are down about and miss. I actually like the Rehot. It's kind of a defining characteristic of the Pelagos, but in totality it still comes together for a nice package and certainly a great dive watch for around $4,000. Now we did take out a big chunk of our budget with the dive watch category, so we have to go lighter somewhere. I decided to go lighter with the everyday category, something that could, of course, stretch us out if needed to maybe be more dressy, but also, of course, have enough upside from the water resistance department, be able to take a beating. And the watch I decided on was the Ball Fireman Enterprise. This is that entry-level model for Ball, and I also find that it has less of the Ball watch styling and DNA compared to some other models, given the slim tritium tubes that are gonna be on this one. It's not as much in your face as some of their other models that might just be too much for some people. I think Ball, from a design standpoint, is a polarizing brand. Uh, some people are just not gonna dig it at all, but I would say this is a little bit more of an easier one to digest than others. But also, considering this watch comes under $1,000 in price, I think it makes it that much more compelling. 40 millimeter case, 48.5 millimeter lug to lug, making it wear very true to that case size. Thickness, 11.3 millimeters, getting tritium tubes, although not going to be as prominent as some other models within uh, their many lines and families. 100 meters of water resistance, SW200 on the inside, pretty much a no nonsense everyday watch for $1,000 and one that often I would say is overlooked. I like the fact that it has Cleveland roots, basically basically where I'm from, uh, the industry of the expansion of railroads. Definitely check out my video where I actually went to Kipton, Ohio, where they're really the beginning foundation of why this brand was created, uh, was founded. So definitely check it out. I can link to that in the description. One of my favorite videos I've ever done. I just kind of drove down the road and went to Kipton, Ohio, and it's about, eh, about an hour away from where I'm from. Uh, but really having that connection, also considering that you have a really solid watch here for a thousand bucks, underrated, and can complement some of the other models that we have here. And now to round us out from the dress category, one of my personal favorite watches, I'm actually wearing one right now, 
the Longines Heritage Classic sector. So these models to me are a great middle ground of what I think a modern type of dress watch should be. It does have this vintage look to it, which naturally is going to have some elegance that's going to be projected out. But a sector dial here, it almost feels more like a everyday style execution. Like this would not look out of place if you're wearing it with a suit or tie, or if you're also wearing it with something that's more casual, it just works. I always say it's easier to dress something that's intended to be dressed up down than vice versa. You're looking at 38.5 millimeter case, lug to lug of 47 millimeters. You can go for the black dial version or the silver dial version. That is going to cause our price to be a little bit tight. If you go for the bracelet version, you might be going over a bit, but hey, hey, maybe you have $7,200 or $7,300 to spend. And for that, you'd be all good. Nice reliable movement on the inside, over 70 hours with the power reserve and getting a silicon hairspring as well to help against magnetism. One downside of these watches is the 30 meters of water resistance, but given that this is going to be filling the void of the dress watch in this three watch collection. I don't think that's a big deal, but maybe something for other people that are just looking in the direction of this watch to be concerned with. It doesn't bother me at all when I wear this. I just put a uh, aftermarket bracelet on it. So it kind of has more of this uh, sporty type of look to it, but I went with the silver dial version. I just love this watch ever since it was unveiled in 2019. And I think it's a great way to round out our collection here. All right, guys, now that is it. Seven ways to build a $7,000 watch collection. These videos are always a lot to put together and are always long, so I apologize for that, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that. It does help out the channel, and it's a great indication that you wanna see more of this as we just continue to scale up. We can keep doing this uh, in the future if you guys really do enjoy these videos. Happy to do them. Kind of fun to think about just the different personas and how somebody can navigate spending their $7,000 or whatever dollar amount, because at the end of the day, watches are completely subjective. Objective. There's so many different ways that you can build your collection. I think it's just kind of fun to think this way. Also, be sure to check out teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the new products that we carry. Also, check out the pre-owned section, getting new models in every single week. Be sure to follow on Instagram and see some great photos of watches and see what content is coming down the pipe. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.